Okay, what is a miracle? Somebody define for the class. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Something of impossible. Okay, exactly right. Um, two parts to a miracle. One is it's something that cannot happen. Okay, unless God does it. Now, if you don't believe in God, or if you believe in a world that was created through the Big Bang and the evolution, then a miracle is impossible to you. But to those who believe in God, they think there are times God can change nature, that God can walk on water, that God can uh, feed 5,000 people from two sandwiches. It's something that can only happen if God does it. The second thing is it has to be positive. It has to be good. If it's negative, we call it a plague. God, and we do believe that sometimes God caused bad things to happen, but we don't call that a miracle. We call that a plague. Um, but here's the more important question. Why would Jesus do a miracle? Well, what's the point? Why would he bother? I can think of two reasons, Tyler. To prove himself. Okay. Um, as you notice, that we've been talking about Jesus. He, for his three years of his ministry, made a habit to go around. Jesus was not a private man. He didn't want to stay in one spot and tell ten people. Jesus wanted the world to know. So as we read through the books, he's always going somewhere. Capernaum, Bethsaida, uh, Jerusalem, Jericho, Caesarea, the other Caesarea. Um, he's always moving and always on the go and always teaching when he goes. Part of his lessons he was going to teach is, you should trust me about God. You should listen to me about God because I'm God's son. Now, if you're going to come with a, from an out-of-towner and you're going to preach that you're the son of God, what are people going to think about you? Imagine here, uh, say to our church came today a guy named Bob, and he's from Bedford. Let's say Bob from Bedford steps in here and he says, guys, I want to change everything you think you know about God. And you need to listen to me, not what you think or not what you've heard in this Bible of yours. Because I'm God's son. My mom was a virgin. And I was born of the Holy Spirit. What are you going to think about Bob That's from great. Bedford? He's a liar. Yeah. You're going to think he's a liar or a lunatic. And Jesus would have faced the exact same problems. So oftentimes he's going to do miracles because if he does a miracle and then he talks about I'm God's son, what are you going to do? You're going to believe him. You're going to listen to his teachings. I think there's a second reason. That was excellent, Tyler. Why else would Jesus do miracles? I think Jesus loved people, and I think today he still loves people. And when Jesus would go to a funeral and he would see a mother crying, he'd want to get involved. If he went to a wedding and they were too poor to afford wine, he'd get involved. If his best friends were in a boat that was about to sink, he'd get involved. Um, and I think a lot of his miracles we're going to see are because his heart breaks, and he does exactly what you and I would do if we were Jesus and we had his powers. So let's get into it. Um, the first one, can we start with Hannah? And everybody, does everybody be ready and have your Bibles handy if you could? Because we're going to read a lot today. I want, I want the Word of God to speak to us. And again, we're going to look at four miracles that all take place within a day of Jesus' life. And we're going to start 35 through 41 for the top row. And the same day when the even was come, he saith unto another. You've got King James, right? <laughs> okay. It's an okay Bible, it's just it was written in 1588, so it sounds really old. All right, that day when evening came, he said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. And leaving the multitude, they take him with them, even as he was in the boat, and other boats with him. The furious squall, squall. came up, and the waves swept over the boat, so that it was nearly swamped. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on the pillow, and it awake him, and say unto him, Master, carest thou not if we perish? That we perish. He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then, then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and waves obey him. All right, the uh, first one, we say there's a powerful metaphor in it for today. Um, what, but for, let's understand the story first. What happens? Yes. He and his friends are out at sea. A terrible storm comes up, and the ship is probably missing. Exactly. And then Jesus comes out. And sea of Galilee is not that big of a sea. When you stand at one side, you can see the other side. It is far. They say it's five miles across and ten miles up and down. So it's far. 
And Jesus' disciples are just basically making a shortcut. They're at Capernaum, which is like at 12 o'clock. Mm-hmm. They're wanting to go to Bethsaida, which is like down about 7 o'clock, or no, 5. Um, and rather than walk the whole distance, they thought, well, let's just get in our boat and go across the sea. And Jesus is taking a nap while they are going across. However, they're out in the middle of the sea, and what comes? A storm. A storm. Uh, something they couldn't predict, something that they, they had no control over. And they're afraid the boat's going to get tossed, and the sea is deep enough that if you fall in it, you drown. So they're afraid. They wake up Jesus, and what does he do? Peace be still in this storm, this calm. Somebody think, how could that be a metaphor for us today? How could I apply that to my life? In our time, in our life, we're going to have storms, aren't we? Has anybody ever had, raise your hand if you feel like you've had a storm in your life before? Okay, some of us probably say we're going through a storm right now. We've had times where we're unsure. You know, maybe our parents have broken up, or maybe someone we really care about has rejected us. Um, we've been hurt. We've been, some of us have been, you know, abused in different ways. Sometimes we have storms in our life. What do the disciples do? They woke up Jesus. What can we do? Wake up Jesus. And he can, calm, peace be still, take it away. Beautiful story. Jesus shows his power over the physical world. I'm going to throw out an idea to you guys today that Jesus does these four miracles, and they're not an accident that in one day he does four miracles. I think he's going to try to teach his 12 disciples something, and there's a lesson that we can, as his modern-day disciple, also pick up. He's showing his power over the physical world. So if your problem is in nature, who's, who's the God of nature? Well, our God is. Um, Jesus questions his disciples. I think this is interesting. What's the question he asks them? Why do you have no faith? Well, why would he ask that? Because they're freaking out. Yeah, they had Jesus. And they thought they were going to die. And I thought, how many times we have Jesus? I wonder if Jesus was here today and if he would save us, if he would look at us and say, oh, you have little faith. Why do you doubt? Because we have Jesus. We have no worries. Um, it, it's a, I've, I've often thought that there's times that if I do worry, if I do fret, it's really the problem is not the problem. The problem is my lack of faith. That I don't think my God is more powerful than the problem. And I'm afraid that I might you know, be destroyed by whatever storm it is that's in my life. Hey, let's go forward. Everybody please welcome Amanda Collin. All right, let's go forward to Matt, to Mark 5. Let's see what happens next. Was it your turn, Haley? Okay. They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an evil spirit came from the tombs to This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bring, no one could bind him, and not even with the chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he pulled the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to do him. Night and day among the tombs, and in the hills he would tr- he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted out the power of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the Most High God? Swear to God that you won't torture me. For Jesus, I said to them, Come out of this man, you the Spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission, and the evil spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. All right, Jesus uh, encounters a storm at sea, and now he encounters a storm when the boat lands. And somebody described this guy. Was that the first question? Yeah. Somebody describe the guy that Jesus meets when he gets out of the boat. Just, just throw out words that describe him. Possessed. Okay, demon possessed. There's about ten words we can throw out. Strong. Okay, powerful. Power. <laughs> 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 
Um, yeah, he's got he's got broken and tattered chains. They've tried to chain him up, so I'm guessing at his ankles and at his wrist he would have chains, but they're probably drooping and dangling, and you know when he moves he probably makes that noise like that in a Scooby Doo movie. Yeah. What else is he like? What is he like? Probably yeah. smelly. Okay, stinky. Um, we know it, it tells us in the scriptures. Where is he living? In a cave. Okay, in the tombs, actually. They're, they are caves. Oh, so like but that. what are in the caves? <laughs> Dead bodies. Dead bodies. Um, so that's where he's living. He's not clothed, so he's naked. And he has taken broken pots and broken, I don't know if it's glass or clay or what, and he's tried to kill himself, but he's been unsuccessful. So you're going to see major scarring. Okay? This is the man Jesus meets. Um... And Jesus does what for the man? Takes the demons out of him. Okay. Um, he realizes the problem is not physical. The problem is Spirit. spiritual. How many times, guys, are our problems spiritual? They may manifest themselves physically. You know, we may have eating disorders or cutting or for guys addictions. But the problem is spiritual. We're trying to cover up the physical. The man thought, maybe if I can hurt myself enough, then I won't feel the pain that's in my soul. Jesus recognizes the spiritual problem. Sets the man free. It's cool about the pigs and all that. We, we, we're not going to have time to study it today because I want to make sure we do four miracles in 30 minutes. But Jesus meets the man again. This time he's dressed, he's clean, he's shaven, and he asks if he can become the 13th disciple. And Jesus says, yeah. I want you to go and tell your tale on what God has done for you. How is this a metaphor for us today? What's that? Yeah. When we are afraid of our problem, then he wants us to go yeah. tell the world how he... Yeah. When Je exactly. When Jesus has set you free, <laughs> don't go... Do you think... How would it have seemed if this man, the next day when Jesus sees him, is still naked, still has chains on, is still cutting himself, and is still screaming and yelling and living in tombs. What would Jesus have said to the man if he would have continued in that lifestyle? What would we say to the man? Yeah, you're stupid. What's wrong with you? Jesus healed you. He took you out of that life, and he gave you a brand new life. And the same would be said for us. When God has set you free, don't go back to what enslaved you. Don't put the chains on that you used to wear. Um, the psalmist writes, just like a dog goes back to its vomit, so does the sinner return to his sin. Um, have you guys ever seen that? A dog will puke, and then an hour later it'll go eat its puke. Yeah. So that's how God thinks of the person who returns to their sin. You've been set free. Don't go back to it. Um, Jesus shows, uh, I should finish that line, Jesus shows his power over the spiritual world. The first one we said, he shows the disciples, I'm in charge of the physical world. Now he shows his disciples, I'm in charge of the spiritual world. So if your problem is physical, I can solve it. If your problem is spiritual, I can solve it. Let's go on. Um, flip the page over if you would, please. And the next two stories are intertwined in between each other. Jesus is on his way to help somebody, and then another person comes in. So I want to look at the short story first. Um, the one that is verses 25 to 34, and I really don't remember who read last. You did? So, Morgan, would you start us off, please? Um, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors, and had spent all she had yet, and instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she said,